very happy to be here. Honored to have uh, my two guests, Hala Shukair and Lubna Hamad. My name is Ala Yunus. I'm a research scholar at Al Maurid Center for, or Al Maurid, the Arab Center for the Study of Art. Al Maurid is a research center for the study of art. It is founded by art historian. Where do I go? Um, Sarah. It's not. Uh, it was working before when we tested. Okay, I'm pressing the wrong button. <laughs> That's why there was like all this g line going everywhere. Mesh. So the center is founded by art historian and curator Salwa Mekdadi. It's part of the NYU Abu Dhabi Research Institute. The center works in collaboration with the faculty of uh, with the faculty in the arts and humanities and social studies at NYU Abu Dhabi. We serve the faculty research and the undergraduate education, and we encompass what we call the Arab Art Archive, which uh, acquires primary source materials pertaining to modern and contemporary art across the Arab world. Uh, the center also absorbs the pre-existing Akasa Photography Archive which documents different histories and practices of photography in the broader region with a focus on the UAE and the Gulf. Al Maurid's re research operation has two arms, uh, one dedicated to formulating new analytic categories for the history of Arab art, or how I like to call it, how to write uh, history, of Arab, or history of art from right to left, and a Haraka Experimental Lab for our Arab Art and Social Thought, which takes the intellectual life of the region as a starting point for exploring alternative modes of knowledge production about its societies and history. The Arab Art Archive builds upon an initiative led by Salwa in the mid-1980s, um, and her papers that, like in which she had interviewed a lot of artists and accumulated a lot of materials are uh, available at, at NYU Library under title Salwa Maqdadi Papers. Renewing that earlier archival project, uh, the Arab Art Archive seeks not only to consolidate the documentary record in a digital resource available to students and scholars worldwide, but also to use the record to de develop new historiographic frameworks that move beyond established paradigms in the discipline of art history. Um, to this end, we al Maurit pairs the construction of a digital archive with a range of endeavors, both scholarly and artistic, and try to identify new categories of analysis and interpretation that, as I said, reframe the history of modern art, both regionally and globally. Among the projects that we do is that we bring the discussions that we have in the backstage of al Maurit to wider audiences or to future audiences, to quote my uh, colleague, we are therefore happy and honored to be here today with Hala and Lubna, with whom we have been collaborating on and working on the collections that they have, uh, particularly collections of documents that allow further research possibilities on artists Salwa uh, Raudashkir and artist Mahmoud Hamad. We will hear from our guests each on her own. Uh, and on her efforts, in inherit, uh, so first of all, on inheriting a wealth of documents that relate to the multiple practices and positions of her parent, on how to live with the whole life of an artist who has left a legacy of artworks and documents that require or organization, preservation, and space, in fact, besides and parallel to sharing and responding to interests and curiosities arising uh, around these uh, works or documents. We will begin with Hala, Hala Shukair, who will tell us about living with the legacies of Salwa Shukair, Salwa Rauda Shukair. Hala received an MA in Cinematographic Studies from the Sorbonne University in Paris in 1981, then returned to Beirut in 1983, where she worked in film production. Shukair moved to the United States in 1987 and participated in a number of solo and group exhibitions. She is the founding president of the Salwa Rauda Shukair Foundation. Um, so Hala will present to us on the ideas and papers left by her mother um, 
and how she is taking these projects into the future. After that, we will hear from Lubna Hamad uh, on how she started working on archiving the complete of, of her father, the late Syrian artist Mahmoud Hamad, as well as documenting historical data and the different stages of the Syrian art movement. Uh, Lubna studied architecture at Damascus University and worked at the General Company for Engineering Studies Consulting in Damascus before moving to Amman in 1985. In 2009, she founded the family estate of Mahmoud Hamad, and her mother was also an artist, the Lebanese artist Ria Fakhouri. After these two presentations, we will speak with the guests. We will speak further with the guests and answer any questions that would come from the audience. Hala, the floor is yours. Okay. Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here. It's not a very interesting subject, but thank you. <laughs> Uh, no event happens without many levels of effort. And um, both conceptually and logistically. So many people worked for this to happen. So thank you all. I mean, and for me to be here also required many level of circumstances. Salwa is the force behind this endeavor, Salwa Maqdadi. Uh, she stumbled into my mother working in her studio when she was a young lady studying at AUB. And later, she had a long conversation with her when she was preparing the show Forces of Change, Change that she organized in Washington, D.C. in 1994. I also met Salwa in New York. There, she managed to bring together a group of Arab women involved in the art field. And we used to meet regularly at the loft of uh, Samuel Halabi. It was great. We had, I mean, those were unique moments of empowerment and friendship. So, so I would like to introduce a little bit my mother. Uh, Salwa was born, my mother, in 1916 in Ras Beirut, in a house surrounded by a garden, uh, not this one, located where the lower campus of, uh, of the American University of Beirut is right now. Th that house disappeared. She was the youngest in her family. Her father died while serving in the Ottoman army when she was just one year old. She was raised by a strong-willed single mom who had tried many times to save her husband from the army by bribing the soldier until it didn't work out. He was conscripted and died in 1917. My grandmother valued education and vowed to raise her daughters in the best schools despite all the obstacles a young widow had to face. Mother was sort of a tomboy. She liked sports, she was a good swimmer, she enjoyed math at school, and spent most of her drawing classes at the door because she didn't like tracing, as some teachers would ask her to do. Later, she took art classes with two prominent artists, Farrukh and Onsi, and graduated with a degree in biology from the American Junior College from, for Women which is LAU now. She worked at the AUB library, where she read books and journals and was allowed to take classes. In one of those philosophy courses, she was provoked by a professor who described Islamic art as inferior. So she built an independent research agenda to explore Arabic culture and understand what this new religion stood for and what it brought of new thoughts. She concluded that abstraction and the idea of infinity were at the core of Islam, and as God cannot be described even in thoughts, and that he has no beginning and no end. What is specific about mother is that all her system of knowledge was in perfect harmony and continuity between the time she lived in and her culture, and that she had a clear visual representation of that thought. She, of course, did not take into account other people's superficial understanding of the religion. If it wasn't the essence, it wasn't relevant, and she disliked all frills. I was recently mentioning that my mother is unknown in Lebanon, and the answer came, she is unknown, period, in the sense that we do not know her, and we find her difficult to comprehend or to explain. I still feel this way sometimes. When I look, for example, at her sketches and plans for, plans for water project and kinetic sculpture, I look at them 
with a lot of admiration, but with a blank on my face. I only wish I could understand more what she had in mind to see their potential executed, not only as mechanical poetry as I consider them to be. So when I started this process of learning about mother 20 years ago, I thought I was done. I had finally finished a book about her art after years of work. The project took a huge amount of effort, including two rounds of, of, of photographers, two designers, and two years for Jacques Aswad to finish his beautiful text. It contained most of mother's work in a single volume, and she absolutely loved it. She signed it at an impressive lunch party at Masrah al Madina in Beirut in December 2002, and I was relieved with a great sense of accomplishment. Sadly, in 2007, we had to move from the family house. That was the house before. Okay, that was the family house. Uh, uh, yeah, this one. I mean, this is uh, in 1919. My parents moved to it, uh, my, not my parents. My, my mother moved to it in 49. Okay, so she, we, they moved in 49, and they stayed till 2006. Okay, where was I? So, uh, yes. Okay. Uh, we had to move from the family house for various reasons, including the fact that the building was in shambles. I had to pack my mother and her studio and move them to a smaller apartment. It was a big loss to leave the building, as every corner and every red tile was full of memories. It was where my mother, her sister, and her brother, and their mother had lived since 1949. They had their families and where my mother's studio was. It was such a unique setting. Packing and moving was a daunting task. I left behind many items, although I wanted to keep everything, even those red tiles. Every now and then, I remember and mourn this item or that, such as her chair that was always covered with clay. Okay, recently I start regretting not removing from the bathroom walls the two wooden boxes mother had made for toiletry. The doors were mirror that moved in a certain way, allowing her to stand in between, adjust the mirror, <laughs> and see her hair from front and back. This is how she used to cut her hair by herself. It seems she had planned to never visit a hairdresser. I consider this part of her artistic expression as she had no writings about feminism and never talked about the subject or mingled with a group of feminist artists. This also proved the limits of the written archives. A researcher for the time being needs to have the document in context and the oral history should be adjacent to our understanding. So removing the archive from this would deprive them from another layer of social elements that should share our knowledge. Yes, the process generates new finds. For example, the preparation for the 2011 retrospective at the Beirut Exhibition Center, showing all of mother's work, plunged me into her archives again. Looking into her files, I discovered drawings of nudes she made as a student silk screen scarf she made that I found in the back of a drawer. In addition to other treasures, it was such a beauty having all her artwork on display. Uh, what, yeah, it, this was a feast <laughs> for the eye. Later on, while curator Jessica Morgan from the Tate Modern, Modern was looking with me into old photographs, she noticed the detailed notes that mother wrote in Arabic on the back of pictures she took of Le Corbusier Cité Radieuse in Marseille, while it was being built in 1948. This inspired Jessica to write the introduction to the monograph for Mother's 2013 show. M Mother, had the first, Mother was the first artist from the Arab world to have a major solo show at the Tate, which went on for seven months. This collaboration made me understand new chords in Mother's thinking. It made me recognize that having a new pair of eyes looking with me and explaining the value of what's in the archive is an experience that I want to keep enjoying. Every time I am in a situation like this, as much as I dread the complexity and the nostalgic feeling that comes with it, I find myself enriched. 
And I wonder how will there continue to be new finds when the archives get cut, scanned, and trimmed to fit boxes? How will they still be source of vibrant interaction when they are no longer part of the whole that she longed to honor? After the 4th of August blast, I moved everything out of Beirut to a new place, built specifically to host mother's work and archive. So now her art, her furniture, and her tools are back together, along with the paper archives. Unpacking later made me realize how confusing all those files are. As mother would store things in plastic bags and envelopes, only now have I started housing them in archival boxes. During the second move, the archives got disorganized, and I had to hire an archivist to help me put things back in order. Although that person worked a lot, I do not think the experience was that successful, especially that it followed a system that had nothing to do with the nature of the papers I have. I found letters that mother had written to official mostly to vent her anger under correspondence, although there were no responses from the addressee and not even sure if any of these letters were mailed. This made me realize I should be finding new ways of organizing. I know there is always lots of mysteries, but I should at least know, for example, who had a real correspondence with my mother. I also had problems with organizing the exhib exhibition reviews and articles. Mother had the habits of writing notes on the margin, and those were all mixed up. And I overlooked uh, them without making into consideration now they were collected. I mean, I need to go back to this and find another way to classify them. So, so we need another layer of meaning while looking at a piece of paper or a picture, spe especially that we did not preserve the references to the past, since the physical container, like the house, are no longer here. Beirut keeps changing and erasing everything, and being very professional had to be very personal. What I have done recently was to organize her artwork and photos. In addition, a Dutch artist researcher recently scanned photo taken by mother of her art to try to understand how she looked at that art. These photos, according to this researcher, are not just documentation, but rather visual viewing instruction in which Shuker articulates her working methods and ideologies without using language. So this, I can talk about this if you want later, I don't know. So this is how she, she each sculpture she, she will dis disassemble and reassemble, you know, I mean. Uh, we'll find out if, if those documents were used in, in a nice way when she publishes the book. Now, after 20 years in the process of preserving, caring, and carrying the legacy of Salwa Rauda Shuker, I am faced with new sets of challenges, some I have already mentioned, and other I will sure encounter while running the foundation. Uh, I can share now more. Okay, okay, this is the, the new building for the foundation in, between the trees in Ras al Matan, Lebanon. So this is the fence that leads to the entrance. And, uh, and it was inspired by a sculpture, this one, that was divided the way she divides things and turned them around and reassembled them. So this is the inspiration of the fence. This is one of my mother's theories that she always liked to execute. So we did that. And this is... Uh, a couple of students that came and looked into the archive and you know it's it's fun to see them enjoy, enjoying the, the process so I hope uh, other people come these are also enlargement of my mother's uh, maquettes that were made between 2000 and 2017 I mean she died in 2017 so this is, uh, this is also part of the surrounding of the foundation. And yeah, I mean, those are what I call uh, 
uh, mechanical poetries because I don't understand them. I mean, the picture of some of her notes. So those, I mean, are, are treasures that I don't understand, but that's okay. Thank you. Thank you very uh, much. Yeah, it's very interesting to see or, or to hear how you are also choosing to navigate us or to like navigate with us uh, your experience with these materials and also what you've left and what is left to be also yeah, <laughs> dealt with. Uh, yeah. The work is endless. Endless, yeah. And we will talk about this yeah. after we hear from Lubna. Hello. I would like to thank El Maurit for inviting me to such an important event, mentioning in, a, in particular Professor Selwa Mukdadi and architect and artist Ala Younes for highlighting the importance of preserving Arab artist legacy. And I also like to thank all the behind scene team who worked hard to make this event happen. And last but not least, thank you all for your presence. Mahmoud Hamad. Born in Damascus in 1923, the Syrian multi-skilled artist Mahmoud Hamad was a painter, a printmaker, a medal engraver, and a sculptor. Hamad attended the Italian school of Damascus and Jodat al-Hashimi secondary school, where his teachers, given his remarkable talent, encouraged him from an early age to study art. Hamad took part in initiating many art associations in Damascus in the 40s and 50s of the last century. Then he was granted a scholarship from the Ministry of Education in Syria to study art at the Academia di Belle Arti in Rome and settled in the Italian capital until 1957. Upon his return from Rome, Hamad married the Lebanese artist Daria Fakhouri in 1958 and became an art teacher in Daraz schools, where he lived for two years and started a series of paintings depicting the social scenes of the southern area of Horan. In 1960, he moved back to Damascus and helped with the establishment of the Faculty of Fine Arts. In 1967, a UNESCO grant led him again to Europe for a few months, this time again Rome, Madrid, and Paris, where he encountered renowned contemporary European artists and his works were shown to a new audience, European audience, of course. Back in Damascus, Mahmoud Hamad, alongside Nasir Shora and Diaz Zayat, founded the Damascus Group, Group D, in 1965, an affiliation of Syrian abstract artists. Soon after, in 1970, Hamad was appointed Dean of the Faculty of Fine Arts, where he remained until 1980. Mahmoud Hamad was acclaimed internationally during his lifetime. He was awarded with the Knight Commander Award, Commendatore, from the Republic of Italy in 1976, with the Syrian highest medal of merit in arts and literature in 1977, and the Syrian First Class Order of Merit by the Syrian Republic in 1989 after his de decease. Posthumously, the Syrian government granted him a few other prizes for arts and culture. Mahmoud Hamad, undeniably, is considered today as one of the pioneer artists of modern Syrian art and one of the most influential artists of modern Arab art and Arab abstraction. He depicted abstracts compositions that revealed an extraordinary balance between form and color evoked and evoked both his academic and aesthetic savoir-faire. Now I will talk a little bit about Mahmoud Hamad archives. Documenting an artist means that you are simultaneously documenting the art scene at that time. You document the artist, his group of friends, correspondences, sketches, gifts, anecdotes, that all add to the history of art uh, in that moment in time. It creates a more vivid image of the story of the art scene back then. The artist's estate grows by the effort of the artist himself as a start, keeping track of everything from exhibitions, flyers, and invitations to letters, notes, and sketches 
and work in progress pieces all act to show us the interactive process, the, the creative, sorry, process of the artist. Hamad's studio was at home in Damascus. In one of our visits to Syria in 2010, I discussed with my brother Amin, who is a professor at Concordia University in Montreal. We discussed the importance of archiving the oeuvre and estate of our father, and how to preserve and keep his legacy alive. In order to begin, we needed a structure, as he had diverse works divided into various phases of his career, featuring different media and subject matter throughout the years, spanning a period of 50 years. We started by organizing the works, divided into four periods. The beginning period, Rome period where he studied art, Huron period, and finally, the calligraphy period from 1963 until he deceased in 1988. The next step was to have a professional photographer who photographed all the paintings that we had in the studio, front and back when information is written on the back, the large pieces on paper and medallions so we could get high resolution images in order to create the digital archives. According to the artist periods, we organized the archives within various types of media, including drawings, sketches, and photographs. We also kept records of documents such as letters and correspondences, exhibition catalogs, educational material, articles, and translations written by Hamad. Finally, we arranged all available publications, for example, interviews in magazines, newspapers, and books. Hamad used to photograph his work when finished. He also had a dark room at home where he developed and printed his photos. I went through all the photos, slides, and negatives and scanned them. I also transferred all the videotapes with interviews on the Syrian TV to CDs. The tapes include interviews with other artists like Nasir Shora, Naim Smail, and Dilya Zayat. I discovered that Hamad had also kept internal rec records, documenting details of works, the places they were exhibited, what was sold, published, and in some cases, the name of the buyer if sold. This allowed me to record the details of the works I had information for. On the other hand, most of the works from the beginnings, Huran and calligraphy periods were numbered. Many of them have the number written on the back. This was an additional information to be added to the work details and allowed me to know the missing works in the archives. Furthermore, the number helped me to authenticate the work and to recognize attributed works. So far, there are around 4,600 works archived on canvas, panel, and paper, including sketches, some of them on sketchbooks. But we still have some works that are not archived like some medallions and relief and in plaster. Photos, correspondence, photos, correspondences, documents, doc publications, and catalogs in the archives are records for events that took place in Syria, Rome, and many other countries, like the first art associations in Damascus in the 40s and 50s, the Rome period where many well-known Arab artists were studying, Materials from the 60s, 70s, and 80s include information about the Faculty of Fine Arts in Damascus, the visiting professor from abroad, the first Arab conference of fine arts that took place in Damascus in 1971, followed by the first conference of the General Union of Arab Plastic Artists organized in Baghdad in 1973, and many other details that are important for recording the history of the modern art movement in Syria. I would like to mention here that the archives are also a tribute to all generations relating to Mahmoud Hamad, the previous generation, because they had a passion and worked under difficult circumstances, especially between the First and the Second World Wars, and they had this persistence to work in art. It can be said that the experience of Hamad in the beginnings is a common experience of the generation to which he belonged. 
Suffering was similar, as well as cultural and financial difficulties. Mahmoud Hamad family estate. At this point, I felt it was time to name the archive and give it a purpose. In 2016, I attended a conference in Berlin held by the Institute for Artist Estates entitled Keeping the Legacy. A conference, a conference discussing aspects of artist estate planning and management, which was extremely useful in terms of the knowledge it gave me. When you start an artist estate, first of all, you have to be familiar with the vision and the goals of the artist, which in my father's case are explained in his papers, writings, and articles. There are many issues which need to be taken into account when planning or, or leading on the activity of an artist estate. It is necessary to consider strategic and legal issues, questions of conservation and restoration. It is also important to consider how to keep it alive for coming generations if later generations of artists remain inspired by the work and if curators, academics, and collectors continue to find new and, and invigorating ways to approach the oeuvre. Reliable contacts in the art market are essential. Managing relations with museums, galleries, and auction houses is important in, in terms of selling, evaluation, authentication, and consultation. My role within the estate is provide information upon request to, so to scholars, art historians, researchers, museums, and galleries. Authenticating the works and providing certificate of authenticity for free to encourage people to let us see what they have in their collection. Another major reason why we provide certificates of authenticity relates to people contacting us with regards with regard to possible forgeries. The number of fakes is not that big, at least to my knowledge, and it's easy to spot them. We created a website, Facebook and Instagram pages to make it as accessible to the public as possible. The, on the online materials are, are not accessible to, ev uh, sorry, are accessible to everyone, but not the entire archives and hope to make the archive publicly available in the future. The estate is a personal project that does not receive external finance. It is funded by the sales of the works and by the uh, family budget. So far, I'm managing the estate in an organic way and received advice from arts curators, galleries, friends, and art historians. Archiving is never ending work. I continuously update the archives and keep abreast of exhibitions, auctions, and publications. Future projects in the estate. Initially, the idea was to publish the archives in a printed catalog raisonné. However, I found that this would be challenging in terms of funding. Additionally, an online one would be more feasible to run and update in our case. Currently, we are working on archiving the works and documents of my mother, the Lebanese artist, Daria Fakhouri Hamad. The archives include some photos from the uh, Lebanese Academy of Fine Arts in Beirut, Alba, and from Rome, where she studied art, along with some catalogues and correspondences. We are collaborating with El Mawret uh, by sending materials from the archives for scanning in their labs. We signed a contract with Atasi Foundation in which we, are, we agreed to share the archives to be part of their archives of modern art in Syria in the 20th century. Despite the great progress the estate has made until now, much remains to be done. It's only the beginning of what the estate has in store to keep the legacy of Mahmoud Hamad alive. Thank you. Maybe I'll just go to the very first. Thank you very much, both of you. It's a, a very interesting, amazing, in fact, to see how um, each one of you narrates her um, narrates her uh, experience with uh, with the collection, which is big, massive, heavy, demanding, uh, growing, um, and also there's a there's a 
there's also like interest in it, continuous interest. Probably you get a lot of interest from people that you've never met before that would get in touch, require that they come visit or that you send materials, right? How do um, I'm in, we've like we've visited both of you in your uh, in the place where you work with where you live and work with these collections, and it's amazing to see how close these materials are left are are kept in within your own personal spaces between both of you. How do you how do you deal with uh, materials? I mean, Lubna told us how you had to read or you, you found instructions on how to uh, organize these materials through the writings of your father. Um, but there are probably, so how much of like preparation was, was there before, you know, starting to find these guides or what is, perhaps maybe the question is, what is the guidelines besides, you know, reading? Maybe for you, Hala, what were the guidelines for going through these materials? Um, you showed me some notebooks. Uh, huh? it should be on. Okay, it, it's very difficult. My mother didn't date. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you look at this piece and there is no dates. I had to you know, through pictures sometimes. Ah, this is this picture was taken before the show of 74. So this sculpture must be before 74. So I had I had to find references. And I'm I mean when I look at the book there are mistakes. I mean mm -hmm. it's like it it was very difficult. I mean even now I mean it's with the dates it's very difficult. I can't, I can't have accurate dates because she didn't write, she didn't date. So how do you, how do you find a way? Uh, you know, it, it is because she did shows, so I remember you know, before 62, she didn't, I mm. mean, those were not in that show, so those are made this year. Sometimes picture helped me to find, and sometimes I dated things much later and then I will find them in a picture and I will say, oh my God, what did uh -huh. I do? No, there are mistakes. I mean, I'm... But I'm that's, I think it's beautiful because it kind of also rep um, reflects the process and how difficult yeah. it was and also it's full of trial and error and trying to speculate information. Yeah. And I remember I worked with her once on, on her archive. I have a small book. Mm. Uh, so we sat together and she would say, she would give me dates, but even her dates were <laughs> not really accurate. She would say this, I did this. So I wrote, I made this book and we wrote together. And she would change titles of the mm. sculptures. I mean, they were at one point all called mu'allaqat. Mm. And then they were all called poems. Mm. And then she would say, no, this goes to infinity. Hey, mu'allaqat. Uh, infinite structure. Or in English. But then, Emboitement. She had a series emboitement, which at the end I had to decide, okay, emboitement poems. Because those, she would call them by series. So she worked, she worked by series. But, but I thought those are also relative. I mean, they are not, I mean, when you look at the work, I feel you understand it. And I know after the war, she tried to do the duels. So I know that those duels were made between the, the war started 75, 76, so they were done. She made those duels at this time. So I have few references, but it was challenging when I did the book. I mean, I was living in New York and all the archives was in Beirut and it, it was very difficult. Mm -hmm. But I mean, there are few mistakes, but it's okay. I mean, the book, at least it was, it was out. It, it killed me before it was out, but uh, it was out. So I know there are, now everything seems easier. I mean, after the, doing the book, everything seems easier. And, you In know, fact, I had a related question on this too, because it came to me, bec uh, like it occurred to me when you said there were, there's no, not in her writing something about feminism and the way she cut her hair or the way she depended, self, she was very self, yeah, she was I mean, very independent. Yeah, I mean, there are also two reasons, because her sister was a prominent feminist. Mm. I mean, she, uh, she, she, wa she worked in this. He can under jamaiyat in Ashal Qariye. So, so th this was her life. And my mother, now, I mean, I'm, I'm realizing this because somebody 
came and look at the archives, what she did with artisan. So my mother had plenty of drawings and things, how to elaborate the woman work crafts, you know. Mm. So she did this for her sister. Mm. So now the, I have this part of her archive that is about crafts. And she worked with crafts also before. So there is, there are sections that will be discovered. So, yeah, but my mother never, if somebody asked her in, one, in, in the interview if she is a feminist, and she would say, why are you asking me this? Because I'm a woman? A man could be a feminist. Why are you? So she didn't like to talk about the subject, but she lived as a, as a complete feminist, but she never, never talked about it or said she is a feminist. Yeah, which leads me to the question to ask, how did the question of feminism anyways came out in a conversation that would led, lead you to think and look in the papers and the documents and the no, practices? Be because, because now my mother is like, they always say woman artist. She, my mother never thought about being a woman artist. But it seems all her generation is like that. Mm -hmm. It's now people, how they refer to her as a woman, as a pioneer or as a avant-garde. But she was working. I mean, she never, she never wanted to divide. He became an Arab. Without, she didn't want to divide things. So she was like holistic in everything she did. And she didn't want to be divided into women and men. I mean, we are in a society growing. And you know, I mean, that is another story. But Yeah, but beautiful. And Lubna, you told us that Mahmoud Hamad used to work in inside the house. His, he used to paint inside the house, the library, everything was. You grew up in a place that is surrounded by the practice itself. And many people come to ask you the same way perhaps they're asking Hala about things. We did ask too, what do you think about this? Why did he do this? Why did he do that? What's the intention? So you have to answer questions that are probably in the mind that were in the mind of the artist rather than the mi in the papers or in mm -hmm. the um yeah how do you answer these questions how do you go about you know you've done a lot of uh, cataloging of of things that that would help you you know access or like you know access and share these materials when needed but how do you go beyond the material that exists when the questions come when the questions come in and require an answer that is not so present or not so easily found? Well, I cannot answer for him. Mm. I, if, if if there is something written, then I can answer, but I cannot not answer on, on his behalf, of mm. course. Yeah, and, uh, but you did answer us, like, you know, like you were sharing like materials that would, you had you already also, like, interestingly uh, put together folders of content that you feel that they can also lead to more knowledge about your father, such as uh, folders about his teachers. Yeah. Or... Uh, yeah, this is a piece of information that he left for mm. us to know how to mm. give it to other people, you know. Mm. Because my father was very organized, and he organized everything, and we went through the, and when we started organizing the whole thing together, we followed his steps. So we didn't bring anything from any, uh, uh, our head. It was all written and all organized, and we had the clue how to start and how to do the, uh, the rest of uh, the, the, the organizing thing. Yes. Yeah. So also part of the questions that were, ex or the conversation that was happening yesterday with Al Maurid archivist is on how you've uh, you've explained to us it was a very thorough presentation on how you you've thought about organizing the archive in a way that would uh, reflect uh, the time periods or the work periods or yeah of the artist but also the other materials that exist uh, within the archive how much of this had happened um, or what's the ta what was the timeline for all of these works i mean they were produced over several years yeah were there, like you started with works, with art, and then you realized I should maybe now add a new category for medals or for design works. Tell us about also the way you grew the structure of your archive. Well, it was, as I, I tried to explain yesterday, it was the, 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 the periods 
are the periods of the artworks, the, his style, the development of his style, how mm -hmm. he started in the beginnings, then Huran, then Rome, then the calligraphy period at the end. But the rest of the works, the other works like uh, the designs for uh, medal designs or uh, a stamp design or uh, monument designs, those I, are tr I tried also to put them in, um, uh, in a timeline also, describing all uh, in, in each folder what we have uh, information for, uh, for uh, this work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so there are when there's m information missing, you look for it in the catalogs, and I look for it and I ask for it uh, if somebody yeah. knows about it, and uh, it's very good to have connection with the uh, um, artist family, uh, yes. friends, uh, you know, uh, friends of my father uh, in particular, because they had a lot of common. Uh, um, interest and a lot of common. You know, they, they, if I have some photos, then the other one have the rest of the photos, or, or maybe the correspondences. If I have the the, uh, the sent, uh, yeah. Um, then the letter uh, on the, the other end. The reply is uh, with oh. him. So it's very good to have connections, not only with the uh, in private, Jenny, you know, with mm -hmm. friends, with uh, with. Uh, Families with uh, so they were exchanged with uh, sons yeah. and daughters of yeah, um, which uh, also reminds me of uh, or makes us also think of uh, what is um, what is what would be a plan for you know, what is the ultimate you know, what's I mean now we are you are digitizing a lot of the materials of putting them online uh, what is what do you want from all of this to to bring to you to bring to Mahmoud Hamad's uh, legacy. Um, you know, the new generation, I noticed that, uh, especially in Syria, m even at the Faculty of Fine Arts, many of them, they don't know the works of the old generation, the previous generation. So uh, I think this is the only way, uh, if you, uh, to, to, uh, to keep the legacy of an artist uh, alive. You must work on this. You, you must yeah, do and something. Yeah, maintain continuity with it. Yeah. So, uh, Maybe there are questions from the audience? Or I don't know how we're doing with time, Zara. I don't see. So how many minutes? To yeah, we're good. We have five more minutes. q and so does anyone have questions? No questions. I <laughs> yes, I can be, oh, there's a mic, there's a mic on. It's uh, it's working. Fine. Yeah. It's out of uh, the archiving. Uh, actually, um, uh, back to the last uh, slide, Shukair uh, showed in, in, in her mother's work, uh, which you said that you didn't really understand the the, the formation or uh, uh, the composition. But I found it really amazing. Uh, uh, yeah, the the fence and the the the, the final uh, sculpture. Yes. It, wa so it was know. really architectural, artistic. Ah, it. Was it was it really built in her life, or uh, as as other other works was built in? Uh, ah. Uh, she she worked. She made it in different material. Yeah. And I mean, it was uh, she. She was still alive, but she was in bed. I mean, when when it was executed, but she worked uh, with a, um, a stone cutter that she worked with all her life. She made for downtown Beirut with him. So w with the same uh, artisan, we we enlarged this part, this big one. How big is it? Uh, uh, six meters. Six meters. Out yes. of out of concrete or stone? La, stone. Stone pieces. Stone, uh, pieces. Uh, because it doesn't show pieces of, uh, or or layers of stone. Uh, do you have? An, there is another picture. With, yeah. With a with a person, so you can see. Ah, uh, no, not here. Um, la, la, with the. I mean, this has you and. 
a love. Oh there is a person standing next to it. it. There is another picture. But anyway, this is a stone. Each piece is one ton. I don't know how many tons. And uh, they, this is the piece. I mean, this is the wood one is one of the, of the pieces that she made in wood. It's the same sculpture that is mm. enlarged. Mm. Yeah. So the model was in wood, basically. And Everything is made in clay. Clay. Then she ma makes it in wood. Mm -hmm. Then she, this one was made in aluminum too. Mm -hmm. And then she made it big in stone. Mm -hmm. But she always, my mother will always say these are maquettes. Mm -hmm. And waiting to be enlarged. Mm -hmm. Which she couldn't do when she was really active. Not all of them. I mean, she did few in, in the... Because uh, in downtown Beirut, they asked her to enlarge few, few sculptures. So she did a little bit, but she wanted to do more. And then she got very frail. So I ended up organizing this. I mean, the same way she worked with the, ar with the artisans. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, she, she would, I mean, she would always have help with people helping her sculpt. Mm. Like she wouldn't do from A to Z. Somebody will come, she would work with, especially the bigger pieces. She always had help. She would think like an architect. I mean, she made plans and she wanted this to be enlarged and executed and big. Okay. Okay. Thank you. 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 Uh, anyway, Sas uh, Hamad Allah Yerhamu, Manu Bihaji La Shahadetna, and Elu Fadl Kbir, and Mafi Dai Alla Nimdah. But Kaman Bidi Ul, and no Lubna Al Haya Falan, and no Lahna, and the Chakaram and Kul Albna, La Anna Hi Amma Tafaz El Aris. ومن خلال حفظ إرسا أبوه عم تحفظ إرس سوريا كلها ففعلا نتشكر من قلبنا من جوا وللأسف الشديد لحنا بوضعنا بسوريا ما عنا أي مجال للعمل أو ما في في مجال للعمل بس ما في حدا مهتم بعتقد غرقانين بمشاكل سخيفة وبيخة وكبيرة فبدي تشكر لبنا وبعتقد هذا التراكم هذا اللي عم يصير من طرف هالستات وهالناس الجيل الثاني اللي عم يحفظ ارس اهله هو الحقيقه عم يحفظ ارس وطن بكامله. بدي اتشكر كمان الامارات الواقع الامارات استقبلت كثير منيح استقبلت واقتنت وعملت متاحف واهتمت وهلا نيويورك يونيفرسيتي والمورد فعلا فعلا نحن جدا يعني لازم الواحد يعترف وما يكون عنده عقدة النقص وما يكون عنده حب الغرور لانه بكل بلد فيها شيء وبكل بلد إلى ظروفه وكل زمن إله ابطاله فشكرا على شكرا على المورد لبنى حبيبتي تانك تعرفت عليك أنا زائرة الوالدي ببيتا براس بيروت و إيه براس بيروت كانت زرتها والحقيقة اللي أخذني الأستاذ سمير صايخ فالله يرحمه و... ونحن منكم بالأساس يعني يعني تكوننا من خلال الناس هدول نحن ما إجينا من السماء هيك نحن فعلا تكوننا من خلال هالناس واذا وذلك لنا معنا سوري ثانك يو يا ميبي ذا اي واز از ذير مور كويشنز ذيرز وان مور كويشن هير Hi, Ms. Al-Khair. Nawartoon al Naharda. Um, I'm always interested in the stories of what shaped um, the journey of, of people. And 
I was wondering while you're archiving your your um, parents' work, how much of them did you see in you as you were unfolding and learning more about them and as you went? I'm sure that there's a lot of, uh, um, actually, uh, both of you, please. Uh, I'm just wondering, while you're uncovering and reading and learning and exploring, I'm sure you went like, oh my God, that's just so me. Or, oh my God, this looks like me. Or, oh my God, this is exactly how I would have thought in this specific situation. Did you encounter such situations and how did it make you feel? In the mic, please, we ask Ashan, the translator. <laughs> They are my sibling. I'm very jealous of them. <laughs> my, my mother would say, Hub male or halab male. They're equal. We're equal. So, so, no, no. I'm, I mean, I love them. There is, I don't know if I see myself, but definitely there is rivalry. I mean, I'm so jealous. Yes, indeed, Yani. When I look into the photos, when I go through the photos, the correspondences, Yani, you see the inside stories, their relationship, how it was, uh, their parties. Their, the, there are some very funny uh, photos. And uh, the funny thing is that I, I recently, uh, I was introduced to, um, uh, هلا بيجي الاسم فنان عراقي هو كان بروما كمان so I sent him some of the of the photos um, one of them he was pushing the car of my father he had a small topolino and he was everyone was pu pushing the car and the girls were sitting in the side inside the يعني جوا السيارة فيعني there are some some very funny stories yeah <laughs> But this organization and you know the categorization and being also very yeah. meticulous and yeah. all of that, oh. I think it also comes <laughs> from uh, this. Sad <laughs> <laughs> oh, sad okay. So I think I don't know how much time I think we run our over the our five minutes. We're good. I mean, this the, does it mean we can add? We can we can. We would like to thank you. Like for sure, uh, your what you've been doing is fascinating. It's uh, letting a lot of people also learn, uh, like come closer to the, the lives of these artists. They come closer to the, to the, to the, you know, to their inner thoughts, to how they spoke to themselves. Maybe sometimes how they left all these things. Perhaps sometimes feeling or knowing someone is going to come to look at them, but many times they were doing much of this to, to, to lead their own lives. It's uh, definitely not easy. But um, what, is, what is amazing here is that also the more people have access, the more interpretation happens. And, and sometimes maybe this interpretation is come, it's not necessarily uh, related to how your imagination of, your, of the artist that you're... Um, custodian of their works, but uh, what I want to say is that this is like um, uh, a big load, you know, we understand that it's a big load because there's not, I mean, besides all these like lives of the art itself, which is normally what people is looking at, these documents have their own other life too, that you are also keeping it alive, both, both of you. So I'd like to thank you very much for uh, the way you brought us into your worlds and for the work you've done. On, on these works and for collaborating with us and we hope that this uh, comes soon to the to more to broader publics on our on our platforms and to art abu dhabi for having us thank you thank you, thank you.